morning to everyone, and good morning and hello to those that are uh, looking in on this uh, video. Thank you for doing that. Take your Bibles, if you would, please, and turn to the book of John. We had been in the book of Matthew for a long time. We were trying to go kind of, sort of, chronologically. Uh, we missed a few things, but we've just been taking our time going through the Gospels, looking at the four Gospels. One of the big lessons that we can see in going through it like, like that is comparing uh, the Gospels one to the other and looking at parallel passages is that um, when you look at the four of them, you get a tremendous amount of information on any particular subject or teaching that the Lord was bringing forth. So it's good for us to do that. It's been a very good um, uh, exercise in, in that respect. So we are in John now because John has um, a lot of information from the time we're in the upper room. We looked at the, um, what's called the Last Supper back in Matthew chapter 26. But we jump over here to John and look at some of the things that take place. Because some of the things here in John are not in the other ones at all. But uh, it's just fascinating the way the Lord has put it all together and given us the four Gospels to, uh, to have a look at these things. Now, from chapter um, 13 to 17 is... Uh, a lot of it is in the upper room. We're going to look at that a little later. There's a bit of discussion as to where some of it was of the chapters 16 and 17, but um, it's before Gethsemane anyways. But a lot of it and most of it is the upper room. Sometimes we read our Bibles and we think, well, when we see that the Lord Jesus, uh, uh, they just had their supper and then they were done. There's a tremendous amount of teaching here before he goes uh, to Gethsemane uh, to get arrested. Let go to the cross. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Father, we just want to thank you now, Lord, for this time that you've given to us. We just pray you'll help us to understand these things and then make applications to our hearts with these things, Lord, that you be glorified. And we just thank you now in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. So, like I said, the, um, the chapter divisions here can sometimes throw us off when we're studying it because you get an idea in your head that you come to the end of a chapter, okay, that's the end of that, and something new starting. <coughs> Oftentimes, the, the conversation or the teaching just <coughs> keeps right on going, doesn't it? Yeah. So we had, or I had uh, <coughs> taken from uh, um, all the teachings and the events and the events and teachings at the Passover supper and just shortly after I have about 14 different major things here and we're still on the part on the fifth one where Jesus is uh, washing the disciples feet so we're, we're going to continue with that today so just to give you an idea of how much stuff's there but you know that already okay so we uh, we kind of we left off well first of all uh, John chapter 13. Before the Feast of the Passover, Jesus knew his hour was come. We dealt with that last week. We looked at the application for ourselves, knowing our hour. We do not know it, but be ready. Uh, supper being ended, the devil having been put into the heart of Judas. We saw that that didn't mean that the devil entered him at this time. That he did enter him uh, two days earlier when he went and made the um, deal with the, uh, the priests and all those characters. And this was, uh, it meant that he put into his heart like Ananias and Sapphira, and you read in chapter 5 of Acts, he was asked that, we read the part of uh, Satan has put into thine heart to lie to the Holy Spirit. He didn't enter into them, but he put this into their hearts. This is what happened here. Over in uh, verse 27, after the Lord Jesus gives uh, Judas that, that sop, that piece of bread dipped into the, into the bowl, and gives it to him, it says, then Satan entered him to, for the second time, to go and uh, 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 betray him. Okay, so uh, verse 5, or well, verse 4, he rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. And after that, he poureth water into a basin, began to wash his disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Now we looked at last week that we have here is the lesson the Lord Jesus was teaching them was one of humility. Because they had a problem with that, didn't they? Because we read earlier that with um, the Lord said back in the book of Acts. Now remember in John here, we backed up in time a bit. We're looking at the whole thing again. That uh, the Lord said that one of you shall betray me. And they were like, well, who is it? It's not me. Is it, or is it I? Is it I? And 
And basically that kind of devolved into, the, there was an argument over who was the greatest. Uh, there, well, I, I wouldn't do that, surely it wouldn't be me, and blah, blah, like that, you know, blah. Um, so we see that um, the Lord's going to teach them something about humility. It's not about being the greatest, it's being what? The least, the servant. The way up is down, you know, it really is. So we, we see that. But here we have the Lord Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh. Now he takes his garments off. He wasn't completely naked. It says outer garments, okay? And he have a towel there. And then he, he goes and he's washing their feet. It was the custom back in those days in that area. They wore kind of a sandal. I guess they wore a sandal. It was kind of, it was. And your feet would get dirty walking around, eh? And you come to somebody's house, and they would give you water and you wash your feet and that. The Lord talked about that. It's a one fellow invited him over, but never gave him even water to wash his feet. And he talked about that was where um, Mary was anointing the Lord's feet with uh, her, the oil and such. So we see the Lord doing that. He has a, a basin, and he begins to wash their feet, and he's going around them one by one. And we're going to start then at verse 6. And then cometh he to Simon Peter. And we know Peter is quite a character. It's quite a study. Uh, we study Peter by himself. You know, study any, anybody by themselves. But he's kind of impulsive, isn't he? He's just right there. He's the first one there. He's he shoot first and ask questions later kind of guy. That's, that's Peter. Then cometh he to Simon Peter. And Peter said unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Now in my Bible, I underlined that word my with three little lines. And I think that's how he would have said it. Lord, washes my feet? Lord, are you going to wash my feet? You're the Lord. What are you doing? You're not going to wash my feet. And how difficult is it for us sometimes to fathom that God Almighty, who made everything, who is above everything, that he would stoop to help us even with anything. You've probably heard of people, some, sometimes we hear once, once in a while, we hear of somebody that doesn't think uh, they need to pray because, well, God knows everything we need. And some, I remember one fellow said, I didn't want, didn't want to bother God. Like, but isn't it something, folks? I don't know about you, but I ask him for everything, you know? Mm -hmm. Everything. Lord, help me with this, this, everything. everything. I'm working on some of those rusty old cars. I says, Lord, this is impossible. I need a miracle. Please help me. And guess what? It just works out perfectly. Not every time, but most of the time it does. But God is there. But sometimes we, we how difficult it is, and then we end up getting ourselves into a bit of a a, 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 a slough of despond or something. You know, but because we're looking at ourselves, we look to, to the Lord. He He wants to help us. He wants to be there for us. He He wants to do everything for us. If I can put it that way. When you think about God coming that near to us and yet nearer than near, and living right inside there. Do you have sometimes, you probably do, of course you do, you have thoughts and things sometimes that aren't appropriate, okay? And we subject God to that stuff. God Almighty who is infinitely holy, and there he is. And we have things that happen or we see whatever, but this Lord, this God of ours wants to be with us, for, wants us to be with him forever. He himself is the example of humility and grace. And he's trying to teach these disciples. And not just the disciples, this is just for them. At the time it's for them. But this Bible is preserved, isn't it? These words are preserved. And this is for us here today. The Lord wants to teach us this thing. It's how you look at the other one. So they were saying, I'm the greatest. I wouldn't do that. Get it all backwards, bud. Get it all backwards. It's about the Lord first, then others, and then ourselves come last. But uh, Jesus answered and said unto him, "What I do, what I do, thou knowest not now." I mean that mean uh, the word "knowest" there means to understand. You just, you just you don't understand that now. I get that he says, but thou shalt know hereafter. Now, at first I thought, well, okay, that means hereafter. And after the cross and stuff, uh, he, they would know. But I think he's referring to um, later on in verse 15, he explains what he was doing. Okay, He explains it to them. 
He says, right now you don't know, I'm going to explain it to you later. I think that's what we uh, get out of that after, the, after these things. And Peter saith unto him, now here we get a, a thing from verse 8 to the first part of verse 10. There's a tremendous, tremendously huge lesson here. Um, before we do that, I just want to take a rabbit trail here. Just a question comes up sometimes. We look at verse 7. He says, uh, um, he says, what I do is now, what I do, what I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. So he's going around, he's going to wash their feet. Let me ask you a question. We'll get back to this other in just a minute. Did the Lord Jesus wash Judas' feet? Judas was here yet, you know. He was there, okay. He had been out and made the deal with them two days earlier. Now he's sitting there at the, the table. And then he's, he'll go up after, after when the Lord Jesus gives him the sob. That's, and he goes out, then that's after when he makes the new covenant and such. But he's there for the washing of the feet. Okay? Was, uh, uh, did he wash Judas' feet? Um, he's saying, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. Well, Judas didn't have a part with him, did he? He didn't believe. Well, I just want to throw a couple things out there. Um, later on, oh, let, me, let me do this. Uh, Peter says in verse 8, Thou shalt never wash my feet. And Jesus answered said, If I wash thee not, that's no part with me. And in verse 10, Jesus said to him, He that is washed needeth not to save to but to what not to save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. The word wash there in verse 8, you have it twice and you have it once later. Uh, means to wash a part of you, like you washed your hands or washed your face. There's a particular word for that. But right there in verse 10, Jesus said that then he that is washed needeth not to save to wash his feet. That word washed right there means to bathe, completely immersed and washed. Okay, it's not just washing a bit, the whole thing. And this is what this is the lesson he's bringing out. So um, Judas wasn't washed, bathed, as it were. But Jesus was going to wash his feet. Okay, uh, He didn't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But no one knew who the traitor was. I think he must have washed his feet because they didn't know who the traitor was. They were thinking it was somebody else or this person. And then they would think it was Peter after the Lord says, you're going to deny me. Because uh, if no one knew who the traitor was, and if the Lord Jesus had not washed Judas' feet, they would have been suspicious of him when he announces that. So isn't that something, folks? You just stop and think about that for a minute. Washing the feet of him that was going to betray him? Well, somebody might say, well, he was giving him a chance to get saved or something. No, I think it's too late for that because what if Judas had got saved that night? There would have been no cross. There would have been no Lamb of God on the cross on that, uh, on that Passover day. Okay? But you just see the mercy of God, the, uh, the, the love of God, even though Judas is his betrayer, betrayer of God Almighty, he washes his feet. I, I think that's just tremendous, don't you? And there's a lesson in here for, for us, uh, uh, another one here, if you look at it. Uh, Peter says, uh, Thou shalt never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him and said, If I wash thee not, that's the partial washing, thou hast no part with me. And Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. He says, wash all of me. And the Lord says, you don't need to be washed all. You are already clean. So there's a spiritual lesson here. He, how, he was referring to the uh, being spiritually cleansed by what? By believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? What he's basically telling them here is, um, for the most of the disciples except Judas, they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. They've already been bathed. You've already been washed clean. But what you need is to have your feet washed on a daily uh, 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 basis. Okay? He says, or you will have no part with me. Let's just consider that just for a moment. <clears throat> we have in our Bible, in, uh, if I can find it. Yes. In Titus 3, 5 says, according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. But listen to this verse, Ephesians 5, 26. 
that he might sanctify and cleanse it by, with the washing of water by the word. You could say that that in Ephesians is a direct uh, uh, reference to this right here because the Lord is saying you already believe in me. You don't need to be cleansed again. You don't need to be completely washed again. All you need is a daily washing by the word of God. The washing of the word of God. He's saying here, you will have no part with me. Do we go sometimes a period of time or leave days off where you don't touch your Bible, you don't read it, you don't come before the Lord, you don't spend that time before the Lord? We walk in the filthiness of this world. We walk through the filthy, the filthiness of this world. We pick things up, we hear things, we see things, we interact with things we should not perhaps. We need to be daily cleansed. This is the teaching here. You need to be regularly cleansed. You don't need to be saved again. You're already saved if you believe in Jesus Christ. But you need to be washed on a daily basis by the Word of God. He says, and if you don't, you've got no part with me. We have sins that we don't even know that we commit. Back in Hebrews, it talks about the, the errors of the people. That means uh, sins, of, um, sins that they don't know anything about. And you're supposed to take some time in the Word of God and prayer with the Lord. And just get right and get straightened out. And we need that daily. Do we see that? But do you see where he says, if you don't, you have no part with me. It doesn't mean you have lost your salvation. It means there's something wrong with your fellowship with God. There may be some sin or something there. We walk through the dirtiness of this world. On a, a, all day long, this world. And we need to take some time and have that foot washing. Don't need to be completely washed again because we have been. He says it's the walking through this, this old world that dirties you and you need to be cleansed. And I want you to do that so you will have a part with me. And I believe that that's one of the reasons that we see today in Christianity that there's not much power anywhere. There's not much anything. Everything's declining and so on and so forth. And people aren't standing up for the Lord Jesus and they're not witnessing and such. I believe that perhaps they've got something in their life and they haven't uh, brought it to the Lord or come before the Lord. You spend time in the Word of God. The, he'll speak to you through the Scriptures. Amen? Amen? And He'll show you if something's wrong. He'll show you if something's there that we should, should, should have brought to Him. You can't carry those things. You can't go on day after day, week after week without spending time with the Lord and time in His Word. He says you need that cleansing. You need that on a daily basis to have part with me. If we don't, there's something to think about. What a thing to think that, that it could not have part with the Lord Jesus. It doesn't mean you're not saved. It means that fellowship has got, we got a problem here. The Spirit of God could be grieved. That's what he's talking to Peter about. He says, you don't need to be cleansed, Peter. You just need this. You just need this. That's something for us to think about. Do you spend time in the Word of God on a daily basis to have your feet washed, to get our, our spiritual feet washed from the filthiness of this world this filthy world that we live in and walk through. You think of how God sees this world and the things that are going on, eh? It's like as if you could just jump right into a cesspool. That's how God sees it. And we need to be washed. He says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. In verse 10, Jesus saith unto him, He that is washed, that's bathed, already believes, needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. He says, and ye are clean, but not all. Okay, here's the reference to Judas, verse 11. For he knew, <clears throat> excuse me, for he knew who should betray him. Of course he knew, he's the Lord. God knows everything, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. He just knows, uh, if he didn't, he wouldn't be God, but he is God, he knows, he just knows that. And we went, we looked over it earlier about uh, uh, the importance of Judas betraying the Lord. That, to, that the sacrificial lamb would go to the cross. Uh, for he knew who should betray him, therefore said he, ye are not all clean. Judas was unclean in that he was an un, 
believer. Could you imagine spending three and a half years with the Lord Jesus himself, seeing the miracles that took place, listening to him speak, and so on and so forth. And it just doesn't, it just doesn't make a dent. Wow. It's just, it's just hard to fathom, isn't it? But it happens. And when I, when I think of that, I think of that song one time that I heard from that uh, um, one, one group. Um, and in, in the song, it uh, had the idea of near to the cross, but far from the blood. Mm -hmm. People can go to church and you can all, you know, we can do all the outward things. But without that belief in your heart, that belief in Jesus Christ, you're not going to make it. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, many shall say in that day, and that's the day of judgment, Lord, Lord, we did this, this, and this. And he says, I'm sorry, I never knew you. For he knew that who should betray him, therefore said he, you're not all clean, that's Judas. So after he had washed their feet, after he'd done that, and he had taken his garments again and was set down again. Okay, now they're sitting down, reclining at the table. And they had very low tables. It was just a different way. I find I think it would be kind of uncomfortable myself. I like sitting up in the chair, you know. But anyway, they kind of would and they kind of cushion things. You'd kind of lay down and put your elbow up on it or whatever, lay down there. And they've got the table there, it was around. And so they did that. They went back and sat down at the table again. And he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? He says, Do you know the lesson here? It's just like what we were looking at here in verses 8 to 10. Do you get it? Do you understand what that lesson is? Do you understand the importance of having that part with Jesus or not having that part? Okay. Do you understand what this washing is all about? In verse 13 he says, You call me Master and Lord. Now that word Master right there is... Um, means teacher, okay? That's what it means. You call me teacher and Lord. That's Lord over all. If we don't make him Lord, he is Lord. Amen? Amen. Whether people like it or not, he is. You just acknowledge it. And ye say, well, for, for so I am. So people sometimes say, oh, Jesus never said that he was God. He just said it right there. They knew what that meant, and the Pharisees knew what that meant when he says, I am. That's Exodus chapter 3. And Moses at the burning bush. He says, who shall I say that has sent me? I am that I am. He stood up many times and said, I am. And, uh, chapter 8, verse 24, is talking to the Pharisees. He says, except you believe that I am. And you have in your Bible sometimes there the word he in italics afterwards. I take and strike that out and I find that in my Bible because he didn't say I am he. He said I am. That's, right. That's God declaring I am God Almighty. Okay? You call me Master and Lord and you say well for so I am. If I then your Lord and Master have washed your feet ye ought also to wash one another's feet. Okay? In other words just to serve in humility to treat others with great respect and we've talked about that many times. When we think about um, the Apostle Paul on the Damascus Road in Acts chapter 9, is it when Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me, Saul? Well, he wasn't persecuting Jesus. He was persecuting the Christians, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. But Jesus was saying, you persecute the Christians, you're persecuting me directly. And every person that's born again is the property of God Almighty, has God Almighty living inside them, we need to be careful how we treat them, how we speak about them, and so on and so forth. In fact, we're supposed to look at each other <clears throat> and lift each other up above our own selves and our own needs. That's what he says. It's pretty straightforward stuff, isn't it? To regard others better than yourself. Verse 15, <clears throat> now he's going to explain. For I have given you an example. I have showed you by example that ye should do as I have done to you. Now, you don't have to go, we should all take our boots and socks off and wash each other's feet. Well, that's not exactly what he meant. That's not what he meant. That was an example of humility. We should treat each other like that. There's some places that say that, you know, that's as important as, say, the Lord's table or something. But 
That's not what he meant. That's not what he meant. Here's an example. Verse uh, 16, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. He says that three times, verily, verily. The servant, that means the, uh, a bondman, the one that's been uh, brought into that place. Okay? If ye, verse 17, if ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. Okay? Now, when we look at the words, uh, the word happy there is actually the word blessed or to be blessed. He wasn't saying for you to be happy. And the, the way we look at happy, the definition of that word that is right there means to be blessed of God. We just stop and think about that for a minute. Happy being happy versus being blessed. Things make us happy. Circumstances can make us happy, you know. But wouldn't it be better to be blessed of God? That's what the word means, is to be blessed. If you're blessed of God, then you're happy, okay? Then you should be very happy. He says, if you know these things, if you understand. He asked them earlier, do you understand? Remember earlier on, he said, uh, another teaching, he, he showed them the teaching, and he said, do you understand this? And they said, yes, Lord. He says, okay, then. And they went on. He asked them earlier, do you understand this, what I have done? Okay? And you happy are you. Blessed by God are ye if ye do them. We can, uh, we can listen to this. We can read this and say, yeah, that's how we're supposed to treat people. That's our attitude, that attitude of humility. And then when you go away from it, you just the same old me first. Well, that's not doing it. There's no blessing in that. But God blesses if we follow his word. That attitude. That's the attitude that the Spirit of God can work through or does work through is humility. If we're filled with ourself, with pride or anger or whatever, I just get a, I get a mental picture of the Spirit of God just wait until you're done. Are you done yet? You done? Because I have work to do and you are the tool I have to use to get this done and I can't when you're in the way. And humility and you will be tremendously blessed. You put yourself on the lowest. Yeah, but... But you don't understand. No, you put yourself on the bottom. But you don't understand. It's, you know, I gotta. No, you don't. You wanna be blessed by God or you wanna do something for yourself by yourself? Okay? He says in verse 8, I speak not of you all. I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen, that the scripture may be fulfilled. And he that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. That was from Psalm 41, verse 9, if you're writing things down. Psalm 41, 9. That's why he said that the scripture should be fulfilled. And it had to be fulfilled in the way it was that he would be betrayed by one of his own and that it would be done at a particular time and that he would go to the cross of Calvary on a particular day, which was the Passover, and he was crucified and offered up as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of God be lifted up. And whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And they have John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He said it twice there in those two, John 3.15 and John 3.16. But he must be lifted up. That's God Almighty. You just picture it in your mind. God Almighty takes on a human form so that he could go to the cross. That would be terrible. But it had to be. Because sin is terrible, horrible. And he's paying for our sins. Now, God Almighty went to the cross of Calvary for me, for you, for every person to pay the price of our sins, the horrible thing those things that we commit, the old nature that we have, but to pay for all of the sins of mankind. And he died on the cross and was buried, and he rose again from the dead on the third day, that if you will believe in him, accept him as your Savior, 
receive him as God Almighty in, in the flesh, Jesus Christ the Savior, as your own Savior. Read Romans chapter 10, verses 8 and 9, with your heart you believe, or is it Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, I forget in there anyways. With all of your heart to believe in him. I think we'll end right there. Just we'll end there with the cross. Mm -hmm. Earlier we sang a, 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 one of the songs with the children. And if he abided in me and my words abide in you, that's John 15. This is what he, it's a direct link to this message that he gave to us and gave to them back then from verse 8 to 10. You need to be washed on a daily basis. If my word abides in you, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, you can ask whatsoever you will, and it shall be done unto you. Okay, And he's going to teach them that, or he's going to go over that in just two chapters later from this point. Tremendous, tremendous things that the Lord is teaching. So I suppose we take that, and don't forget, he says, happy are you, blessed are you, if ye do them. If you would submit to these things, if you would do these things, ask the Lord to help you with this particular thing. We have tremendous, tremendous uh, lessons for us here. This is before he's going to the cross. This is the, um, the very night that he would be betrayed. Okay? And yet he's got so much teaching for the disciples and for us. Tremendous, tremendous stuff. When you read your Bible, you go through the Gospels, um, look up the parallel passage in the other uh, Gospels as well and compare them. It's a tremendous, tremendous tool for us, okay? Anyways, we're going to stop right there. We see the Lord Jesus, the absolute picture of humility, yet going to the cross to die for us, made himself of no reputation, but humbled himself to the death of the cross. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your grace, Lord. We thank you for this time for us to be able to just look into your word. We want to thank you, Lord. We're not going through it too quickly, it seems, Lord, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter, does it? That we just look at it and look at every little thing that's here, Lord. We just thank you for your word. We thank you that we can study it. We thank you that we have, when we believe in Jesus Christ, that we are forgiven of our sins, we are declared righteous, and that the Spirit of God comes and lives within our heart and seals us forever. And that not only that, Lord, that you teach us and you help us understand your word and such, Lord. We want to thank you. We thank you for yourself. We thank you for Jesus Christ, our Savior, and the gift of the Holy Spirit, now, Father. And we just pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we'll stop there and pick it up next week, Lord willing, okay? Thank you, folks. Take care now. Bye. Thank you.